Okay, now I, I, I will talk a little bit about uh, what I've learned from psychedelics. I, I feel self-conscious doing it, but on the other hand, wouldn't it be stupid for me to talk about what you've learned from psychedelics? Uh, that would add presumption to the sins already uh, uh, arrayed here. There are different models about what, how, what the psychedelic experience is. Here's a couple. Building on Western psychotherapy, as elaborated by Freud and Jung, one view of what psychedelics are is it's the part of your mind that you'd rather not do business with. It's the memories of childhood, neglect, or abuse. It's uh, repressed, kinky fantasies. It's, in other words, the, uh, the Freudian idea of the unconscious, that somehow these are drugs which dissolve the boundary between conscious and unconscious mind, and then you can do accelerated psychotherapy because resistances have been pharmacologically overcome. That's one model. It's good as far as it goes. It just doesn't go far enough. Then there's another model, which I would call the traditional or shamanic model. And it says, uh, the cosmos is a series of levels. And these levels are connected by um, um, vertical routes of access which can be thought of as simply flights through space or magical trees or magical ladders. Anyway, there's an, an image of ascent. And ordinary people exist on only one of these levels. But a shaman is not an ordinary person. A shaman is a superhuman person who has the power of animal allies behind them. And they can go up and down in these elevators that move between levels, and they can therefore recover lost souls, see uh, social hanky-panky, theft and adultery, see the causes behind that, see the causes behind disease, so forth and so on. That would be the traditional one. The, what I have concluded after 25 years of fiddling with this is that both of those ideas have a certain something to recommend them, but that they don't go far enough, and that we get more to the meat of this if we leave off psychological, the first explanation, or sociological, the second explanation, and actually go for something a little more uh, formal, to wit, a mathematical model of what shamanism is. And what I mean by that is... Let's think about what shamans do. They cure disease, and another way of putting that is they have a remarkable facility for choosing patients who will recover. They predict weather, they're very important. They tell where uh, game has gone, the movement of game, and they seem to have an a paranormal ability to look into questions, as I mentioned, who's sleeping with who, who stole the chicken, uh, who, you know, social uh, transgressions are an open book to them. Well, thinking about this from a mathematician's point of view, a, a, an all-encompassing explanation that would explain how all these magical feats are done is simply to suppose that the shaman is somehow able to project his consciousness, his or her consciousness, into a higher dimension. Not metaphorically, as in Sylvester Stallone has many dimensions. Not metaphorically, but literally, as in one dimension, two dimension, three dimensions, and four. Because if you could move into the fourth dimension, the dimension orthogonal to Newtonian space-time, seeing what the weather is going to be next week is as easy as seeing what the weather is now. Seeing where the game went is as easy as seeing where the game are. Knowing who stole the chicken is simply defined by looking to see who stole the chicken. And I have noticed that all of biology, not simply shamanism within the context of human society, but all of biology 
is, in a sense, a conquest of dimensionality. That as we ascend the phylogeny of organic life, what animals are, are a strategy for conquering space-time. And complex animals do it better than simpler animals. And we do it better than any complex animal. And we 20th century people do it better than any people in any previous century because we can bind data in so many ways that they couldn't electronically, on film, on tape, so forth and so on. So the, the progress of organic life is deeper and deeper into dimensional conquest. Well, from that point of view, then, the shaman begin to look like the advance guard of a new kind of human being, a human being that is as advanced over where we are as we are advanced over uh, people a million years ago, because we have uh, you know, very elaborate strategies for coding the past. It's a dimensional conquest. So that's part of what I've learned about psychedelics. And I could have left it there, but I never do. I uh, always want to bring more in, under the umbrella of whatever metaphor it is that's being pushed. And what I have discerned is uh, that time is actually speeding up, that the universe is not what physics tells us it is. F physics tells us that the universe is an, a physical system, an entropic system that was born in immense energy and chaos, and will run down with a bang, I mean with a whimper, not a bang, run down into heat entropy and dissipation. Uh, the psychedelic data on this is completely different. The psychedelic data says what that model left out was biology and mind. Now, biology, you might imagine, is a fairly ephemeral, recent, fragile phenomenon. It is not. The average star in this galaxy gutters out after about 700 million years. Not our star. We happen to have the good fortune to be around a very stable, slow-burning star. But there has been biology on this planet at least 2 billion years. Three times the average life of a star. So biology is not some Johnny-come-lately epiphenomena. Biology is a phenomenon more persistent than the life of the stars themselves. And uh, biology is not a static thing. I mean, a star evolving now is not greatly different from a star evolving a billion years ago. Biology doesn't work that way. Biology constantly changes the context in which evolution occurs. The way I have downloaded this into a phrase is the universe is, the biological universe at least, is a novelty conserving engine. Upon simple molecules are built complex molecules. Upon complex molecules are built complex polymers. Upon complex polymers comes DNA. Out of DNA comes the whole machinery of the cell. Out of cells comes simple uh, aggregate colony animals like hydra and that sort of thing. Out of that, true animals. Out of that, ever more complex animals, organs of locomotion, organs of sight, organs of smell, complex mental machinery for the coordinating of data in time and space. This is the whole story of the advancement of life. And in our species, it reaches its culmination and it crosses over into a new domain where change no longer occurs in the, in the atomic and biological machinery of existence. It begins to take place in this world which we call mental. It's called epigenetic change. Change which cannot be traced back to mutation of the arrangements of molecules inside long chain polymers, but change taking place in syntactical structures that are linguistically based. 
And people have probably been using language with considerable facility for probably 50,000 years, possibly more. Uh, in our own time, we have created ever more elaborate languages, ever more elaborate technologies for transforming, storing, and retrieving language, so that we are actually on the brink I mean, of being able to give every single one of you the complete cultural inventory, the complete database of human beings' experience on this planet. That's what these data highways and networks are all about. The nervous system is being hardwired. But what I wanted to draw your attention to about this is it is not only an advance deeper and deeper into novelty, but it's an advance which, in which each successive stage occurs more quickly than the stage which preceded it. So, you know, once you get the Big Bang, then nothing much happens for a long, long time. I mean, there's plasma streaming through the universe. The universe is slowly cooling, but that's the most dramatic complex process in the universe, this cooling. Then, after a certain point, more complex processes come in. Complexification begins to build, and as it builds, it begins to happen faster and faster and faster. And the great puzzle in the biological record is the suddenness of our own emergence, of our emergence, human emergence, out of, primate, out of the primate line. It happened with enormous suddenness. Uh, Lumholtz calls it the most explosive reorganization of a major organ of a higher animal in the entire fossil record. And that's, you know, a great embarrassment to the theory of evolution because this is the organ which generated the theory of evolution. We're not talking an appendix or an eyebrow here. We're talking the very organ which generated it. I think that we are not, that we have taken far too much responsibility for what is happening and that what we took to be a staircase we were climbing is actually an up escalator. And if you will stop climbing, you will notice that it does not impede your upward progress because the ground you're standing on is moving you toward the goal. And I, I think that uh, this idea, which may be the proof that I'm bonkers, requires a fairly radical reorganization of consciousness because what I'm saying is the universe was not born in a fiery explosion from which it has been being blasted outward ever since. The universe is not being pushed like that from behind. The universe is being pulled from the future toward a goal that is as inevitable as a, bowl, as a marble reaching the bottom of a bowl when you release it up near the rim. You know, if you do that, the marble will roll down the side of the bowl, down, 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 and eventually it will come to rest in the lowest energy state, which is the bottom of the bowl. That's precisely my model of human history. And the, now, bear in mind what the competition is peddling. The competition is peddling the idea that the universe sprang from nothing in a single moment, for no reason. Now, whatever you think about that, notice that it's the limit case for credulity. Do you understand what I mean? I mean, if you, believe, if you can believe that, I, it's hard for me to imagine what you would balk at. If we were to sit down and say, let's see who can think of the most unlikely thing that could possibly happen, I submit to you, nobody could top the Big Bang. It is the improbability of improbabilities. It is the improbability. It is the mother of all improbabilities, right there. So I'm suggesting something different. I'm suggesting that the universe is pulled toward a complex attractor that exists ahead of us in time, and that our ever accelerating speed through the phenomenal world of connectivity and novelty is based on the fact that we are now very, very close to the attractor. All Western religions have insisted that God would come tangential to history, but they all lose their nerve when you ask when. 
which is the only interesting question about that hypothesis. I mean, if it's not now, then what the hell difference does it make? It's just pissing in the wind, as far as I can see. Uh, I think that the very real social crisis that is upon us, the crisis of population, of resource depletion, of atmospheric degradation, of epidemic disease, all these crises indicate that we are now down to the short epochs of this process of universal ingression into novelty, and that, in fact, it makes no sense whatsoever to speak of a human future. There is no human future. It's inconceivable, given where we are today, that to speak of the human world a thousand years from now, or 500 years from now, it is literally, it either doesn't exist or it's beyond our power of imagining. It isn't simply going to be non-polluting cars and smaller hi-fi speakers. I mean, that's an idiot's notion. Yeah, clearer TV pictures. Uh, and stu It isn't like that at all. I mentioned this this morning, how when you look at only one line of technological development, automobiles or computers, it looks like you can rationally anticipate what's going to happen. But when you realize that there are thousands of these lines of development all transforming themselves, all moving towards some kind of omega point, then you realize that we're in the grip of what I call a concrescence. And I maintain that you don't have to believe me on this. You can see it from here. You just have to climb a high hill. There's one, it's called psilocybin. There's one, it's called ayahuasca. The view from the tops of these hills is of the concrescence. It lies now closer to us than the Johnson administration, for God's sake, in time. And, uh, uh, you know, I have an elaborate mathematical theory to back this up, which you should gratefully learn you are not going to be flayed with this afternoon, but I think it's going to be very, become more and more important for people to delinearize their view of time, decondition yourself from the lie of history, uh, after all, you know, uh, if, if time were space, history would be a spider web. <laughs> so <laughs> bear that in mind. <laughs>